inviting to talk on simulation-based training and observing emergencies. Um, the talk will be on two parts. The first part, I'll just talk about what uh, simulation is about, and I'll spend most of it talking about the experience that we've had running our own uh, simulation-based training, which is what I think Munis wanted me to share with you anyway. I'd like to thank the part of the steering committee uh, who contributed to the whole cause and some of the data. Uh, Moniz, Tang, Tani, and of course, the master. Simulation is typically involves the use of one or more simulators. It can be a physical object, it can be a device, it can be a situation or scenario you create uh, or environment for reenacting a task as realistically as possible for training and often as well for assessing learners from across various different categories of professionals, be it midwives, be it specialists, uh, be it consultants. And depending on the objectives of the training, some or all portions of an emergency condition can be reenacted using a various combination of either standardized patients, or actors, or devices, many things, or even environments. And the level of sophistication that you use in simulation can be achieved nowadays with a very high degree of realism using virtual reality simulators and computer graphics. One of the first few uh, evidence of simulation was actually from Cetrix, when the midwife, uh, you know, this is designed by a midwife, a French midwife in the 1700s, and she used, so she designed this made of leather and fabric, a full-size uh, simulator, and she used to carry it around to the peripheries to train midwives in deliveries. It's called a machine. Simulation became very important, and by this landmark paper, uh, published by the Institute of Medicine in 1999 to Earl is Human, where when they looked at medical errors in hospitals accounting for deaths, where they found that a lot of the deaths could have been avoided, and a very clear recommendation was that team training programs are essential for personnel in critical care areas, including obstetrics. And they need to use proven methods of training, such as crew resource management, which was very much evident in aviation. And they also summarize very clearly that not, they don't, you don't have bad people in health, but just a bad system. This was further emphasized by another Sentinel uh, paper by the Joint Commission of Accreditation of Hospital Organizations, again emphasizing team training, simulation, and running clinical deals. So what are the types of uh, simulation that you can do? You can do mannequin-based uh, high-fidelity simulation. Uh, for that, I'll show you some examples. You can use standardized patients, and this is used a lot in uh, medical schools for universities, your exams. <coughs> and here you try to uh, test or practice clinical skills. You can use labor ward based drills, and the drills are more uh, situation to the, to the environment where you are, uh, rather than in a clinical lab. And this emphasizes more on team training and, and, your, and your center that you're working on, the system. You can have simulation for surgical techniques specifically, and we do, we do some of this in our, in our course, for example, for compression switches. And you can use computer-based case simulations, for example, like CDGs, where you can run a scenario and the case goes on. A high-fidelity simulation may look like this. The full lab is uh, converted. You can create a whole ward, uh, be it ICU, HDU, or even say uh, maternity labor board with full computer graphics simulating situations from the blood pressure to, to the CTG to, the, uh, to all your alarms going off. And you can record and playback and, and, and feedback on this. Your level of simulation, if you go into the, to, to read more and more about it, it goes very high to even virtual realities for some techniques. Uh, you can use uh, 360 degree simulation if you want. But coming back more down to earth, uh, what we use in our own uh, courses is uh, something what we call low fidelity. Uh, there's not much of computer graphics. And here we use, this, this model is the SIMMUM. Uh, SIMMUM is, uh, the one that we use is basic. Uh, you have a SIMMUM that is attached to uh, more CDG monitoring and, and other parameters that you can uh, require as well. You can even use something even lower. <coughs> You can create a, cut a box, put a little head in, and somebody sits in between. 
So simulation depends not so much on the type of uh, equipment or the environment. It depends on what is the objective you're trying to achieve. And depending on the objective, you have to create your own simulation. Something like this that is very simple. Your objective may be, I want to just test not the skills of delivering a shoulder dystocia, but I want to test how the team works, I want to test how the timing works, say, between decision and delivery, for example. So why is uh, simulation important? Mm -hmm. It's very important for training, whether it's uh, undergraduate training or postgraduate training or whether for rehabilitation. And it provides a very safe method of training without involving patients. It emphasizes a lot of teamwork and team management in a crisis, especially on a subject emergency. It improves communication within the team, so the team dynamics works better. And as you know, the emergencies are getting uh, more and more common, so your skills are also not being tested as much, so the simulation will prepare you. It identifies system failures when you run a drill or when you run a simulation. And there may be system in the hospital that's not functioning as efficiently, and then for you to get feedback and rectify that. Most guidelines, most uh, computation inquiries all recommend drills and simulation. And for some of you in the hospitals, well, who are going for certification, it's also a requirement now that you run either a simulation or drills regularly uh, in your labor board. So if you're running uh, a simulation, you're looking for courses, there are quite a few uh, in the world, and some of you may be familiar with this. Prompt is one of them that's very popular. Uh, the Moyen course in the UK is also very popular. The RCG has something else called Robust. Uh, the Vaticans have something called also Advanced Life, uh, life Support in Obstetrics. The Canadians have got something called Prana. So different courses <coughs> deal with different, uh, they all need obstetric emergencies, but their strengths are different in different areas and they cater to a different sort of uh, um, professionals. In that respect, the OGSM wanted to design something that a simulation called that we thought was more relevant to us and to the region. And in 2014, we started the intensive course of certain emergencies, which became, became known as ICO, and some of you may be familiar with that. This is a simulation course based course, uh, less emphasis on lectures, more on drills and breakouts, scenarios and skills. The content of the course that we, we, share, we have and I'd like to share with you is quite similar to some of them. For example, we do the, the usual postpartum hemorrhage, eclampsia, dystocia, but, but one of the things that we are different from the others is you recognize a C-section, as you heard from the previous speaker, is at least for 30 percent of the deliveries that we deal with, and it's not covered in the other courses. So we've got a full station, a full breakout station, C-section, and one particular station, interestingly, uh, He's talking about second stage cesarean. So we have a model, we have a pelvis, we have a fetus, and we, we, we mimic a situation where the baby's head is deeply engaged, and you then try to deliver. And everything that you heard about is what a, a candidate or participant will go through. Uh, we also talk about cord prolapse, sepsis, late trimester terminations, which are a difficult area. We emphasize a lot on non-technical skills, like uh, quality, safety, communication, um, Participants are given a highlight on, on risk management and how to avoid medication errors. Resuscitative hysterotomy is always a very interesting part that everybody talks about, and we have a station to also go through with you uh, what are the equipment required, how fast you need to do it, and then every candidate goes through this. The other features of the course that is slightly different is that we have a pre and post assessment, but it's not a requirement that you have this for your to get a certificate at the end of it. Increasingly, we're using more and more uh, wireless technology for assessment. Uh, we emphasize a lot of feedback, uh, because after you've done the training, uh, both lectures or breakouts, we sit down with, with the participants and go through the objectives once again, and go through the salient points, uh, and what they did correctly, and what they would like to do better. We like to think that our course, compared to the others, is a bit more adaptable. So every time we go out of the country, we realize where we're going to. And for example, in Malaysia, we run a course that's got four stations. And we run a, abroad, we sometimes run only three stations and get into different types of um, uh, emergencies or scenarios that we more relevant. The course, of course, has been endorsed by AFCO, and the course has also been endorsed by some of the medical indemnity. 
uh, organizations. We have been to uh, different parts of the region, um, other than uh, Myanmar, which we first started with. We've been to Bangladesh, India, Cambodia, um, we've been to India, we're going soon to Laos. I'll share a little bit about our experience that we have had. We, the participants who come for the course uh, do a pre and a post test in the two day course, and they are tested on their knowledge before and after, and they tested on their skills before and after. And we have eight skills that they are tested on the skills on DPH, compression switches, tempo nut, it's a lot of emphasis on DPH. It's a dating section, we do a typical C section station, bimetal compression, dystocias. CDGs and bridge. And what we found was that the knowledge improvement is not significant whether you do the course here or regionally. Most of the candidates will start with the knowledge, if the pass mark is say uh, 100, the pass mark is about say 50, most of them. And the questions are designed such that the answers are given during the course. Anyway. And at the end of the day, end of the two days, you test them again. That would have gone up about maybe that 20 percent to between 60 and 70 percent. So somehow the knowledge starts low and remains fairly low as well. But however, for the skills though, the improvement is clearly significant in all the skills that you test uh, across for them. As a comparison, in Malaysia, for example, if you compare to the other parts of the, the region, uh, there are the candidates are better in recognition of PPH uh, blood loss estimation. They're better in their medical and non-surgical management skills of uh, postpartum hemorrhage. But when it comes to operative kind of deliveries, uh, the, the regional countries are doing much better compared to the Malaysians. They're better skilled in hysterectomies, uh, but they may be less skilled in uh, compression switches. If you look at Tempo now, We found out that most of these countries don't use uh, the temperature that we exhibit. We use the bump pivotal as an example. So they, they are, the skills are quite low there, but very, the retention of the skill at the end of two days is very good. Uh, at the same time, you look at um, compression switches, they are more surgically orientated in their, how they attend to their post, uh, their postpartum hemorrhage. So Malaysians, for example, do not do very well in compression switches as compared to the Myanmarese and the Bangladeshis. We have one station on CPR as the basic. Uh, everybody goes through that. And interestingly, um, all of them will start about 50 percent very quickly in this case. Uniquely, when we found out in Bangladesh when we do the course, when we ran the course for the test. Your feedback was they would not want to participate. They said, look, I never do this, and I don't want to do this. It's all the time I call it this. So the perception was very strong that I just not my feet at all. Some of the core skills we tested were for, say, for eclampsia, joint dystocia, vaginal breach, to try and merge it. The pre-test scores at about averaging uh, about 5 out of 10, and the post-test scores between, say, 8 to 9. And interestingly, you find that for the general breach, there's still a lot of work to be done. Because when you start as a skill, you're, 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 there's still a lot of room for improvement for breaches. If you look at all the skills that we did, each skill that we did, they compare here and regionally. And you combine the different categories of stuff. We have the registrar, we have the specialist, we have the consultant. Interestingly, the consultants, when they first started the course, their level of skills was very poor. Right? Um, the trainees seemed to have better skills. Uh, this one. But to be fair to them, they picked up very quickly. So sometimes when we say, when you have trouble, call the seniors. I'm not sure whether we're saying the right message. <laughs> I've just gone through with you very quickly because of the lack of time, but we have more data to share, if you like. We have introduced a bit more uh, IT in our training, uh, and I think that's something that uh, we, if you are trying to adopt a course, you should also look at by using uh, uh, smartphones, by using things like Google Docs. You can test them uh, online straight away, and in the past, we were testing 
uh, before they, on the morning that they came for the course, and we did not know the results. So now, as you do it online, you get the results straight away, and where the knowledge uh, is deficient, and then uh, allows the trainers to quickly focus on this particular group where they should be uh, the victors of. In our uh, experience, we've had some challenges, uh, especially when you go to the regional area, you find our hierarchical system is very, very strong. So in the team that we do in a breakout, uh, the juniors will not want to participate, and that is a reflection, I think, of what goes on uh, in, the, in the old rooms. The resources are also different. You go to Mongolia, you speak about RCOG guidelines, you speak about NICE, they're not interested, they don't know. They talk about WHO, they talk about FIGO. So we change where you want to change, where you are going to train. Language, of course, is a problem, so we utilize a lot of uh, translators when we go to Cambodia and Mongolia. We have been doing this, and we are still yet to study uh, are we really making a difference in terms of cost? It is a huge cost involved for the equipment, for the simulators, um, the trainers' time, the trainers' expense uh, for their travel, and for the venue that you go. Uh, but there's no answer to that, and if you look at the data, there's also no answer uh, on the cost benefit. So that's for simulation, but are we doing the right thing? There's no, the evidence is still lacking. Um, we probably await the multi-professional simulation-based training and upsetting emergencies for improving that outcome and that hopefully it comes up next year. But there is some data on other emergencies and not obstetrics and one of them is uh, uh, by the obstetric and gynecology green journal systematic review and clearly uh, it says uh, in the conclusion that at the end of this review that you need a simulation uh, training uh, as recommended. Another review that is something similar was in JAMA, again concluding that if you compare with no intervention, technology and hand simulation is consistently associated with outcome, improving outcomes of knowledge, skills, and behaviors. And most of the studies will say about the same. There is a clear benefit in knowledge and skills, clear benefit for the trainers, clear benefit in teamwork, but as far as comparison to clinical outcomes and compared to non-simulation based training, there's not much evidence yet that there is much more superior. Now although there's no evidence that simulation is superior, there is still increasingly uh, more and more recommendations coming out out of the ACO, coming out of the uh, Institute of Medicine, coming out of the WHO. Just about any guideline you read strongly supports the use of uh, simulation based team training in obstetric emergencies, and especially for uh, drills to reduce uh, potential errors um, in your labor. So I think the, uh, the apprentice type of learning of see one, do one, teach one is no more acceptable uh, in the current stage, given that you're exposing the patients to a lot of harm, especially if you're an inexperienced professional. And in future, uh, simulation-based activities will be required for practice. You know, no longer will be a newcomer or a beginner coming to try a procedure for the first time on a real patient without having gone through simulation. Um, I can't talk to you very much about how you can plan your simulation in the interest of time, but you are planning in a small scale if you're a unit, it will be more difficult because you don't have the equipment, so probably better if you're in a bigger uh, setting. Um, you need to prepare uh, what you did, objective that you want to study or what you want to evaluate or you want to teach or you want to train and be very focused with your with your objectives that this is practically what I want to do. Plan, budget, get the right equipment, get the right venue and conduct it um, within a specific time. We always encourage feedback and you should do that as well to get back the feedback from the, from the participants and do the course again. So in summary, simulation is a safe and practical training. You can start with low fidelity models. You don't have to uh, invest in something very expensive. Conduct simulation and drills emphasizing teamwork and emphasize on feedback. It's a very useful uh, tool for revalidation. And I would say attend the ICO if you can't plan your own or attend any of the outside emergencies course. 
More data is required to validate simulation training and conclusion. But I hope at the end of this short 20 minutes, I've generated some interest in you that simulation is a safe and effective training method for the future uh, in your own unit. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman.